Welcome to ASU KED Talks, the podcast. I'm your host, Pete Zaroka, and I'm here today with Regents Professor Aditi Chattopadhyay. She is the Ira A. Fulton Chair Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering in the School for Engineering of Matter, Transport, and Energy, one of the Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering. She's also the Director of Adaptive Intelligent Materials and Systems Center. Thanks so much for joining me, Aditi. Thank you, Pete, for having me. So first of all, uh, I wanted to give listeners an idea of what AIMS, Adaptive Intelligent Materials and System Centers, really does. So what do you and your students study in AIMS? So the AIMS Center uh, was established in 2006 with the goal of uh, creating a platform for transdisciplinary problems, problems that are big enough, challenging enough, that requires the intersection of different disciplines. Um, one of the goal is to develop a unified approach to develop intelligent materials and systems for next generation vehicles. Not necessarily aerospace, but uh, it goes across disciplines. So a lot of your work has been in aerospace though, and that's developing new types, kinds of materials that are not only responsive, but like you said, adaptive and intelligent. What, what exactly do you mean by that? How is, how is a material responsive and intelligent? So the material per se is not intelligent, right? But there are molecules we can incorporate. There are nanoparticles that we can incorporate to create this intelligence. So essentially what we are doing is embedding multifunctional characteristics to the material. So if I want to make it adaptive, I will incorporate certain type of smart material so that my airplane platform can change as it uh, encounters different type of uh, loading. Um, and or I can feel the vibration in an airplane or a helicopter and have means and mechanisms to reduce it or modify it to improve passenger safety. And so it all boils down to understanding the material. And I, I know you work on length scales. Can you explain exactly what that means? So my research theme is knowledge to safety. So what it means is unless I know enough of the material, at the constituent length scale, smallest length scale, I really do not know how it's going to perform at an airplane or an automobile level. So things initiate at different length scales. And there's flaws that are there inherently in the material sometimes can also propagate when there is an external loading. So essentially, if you don't understand the initiation, you really cannot understand the evolution. And by the time you detect it at a system level, it's too late because you know that there is a damage and you have to do some repair work. So that's the goal of merging the different length scale and developing multi-scale platform. When you talk about the initiation, are you talking about a change on a molecular or a fundamental level? It depends on the metal material. So if I'm doing something to the chemistry, uh, I'm incorporating anything that changes the nature of my polymer. I need to understand how whatever I've incorporated, those molecules, how do they interact with the original material? So if it doesn't, or if it does, what is the strength of those bonds? So that goes down to molecular level. And so if I'm trying to understand a phenomena that is at the micro scale, I need to understand these atomistic scale interactions. But if I'm talking about um, maybe a composite material, um, I probably will start with length scales such as the fiber and the matrix constituents, the coating on the fiber, um, and so on, and the interface between the fiber and the matrix. So those are the length scales I'm talking about because that's where damage initiates. So it all depends upon what we are trying to achieve and what kind of material we're talking about. You spoke about a material that is adaptive, giving it adaptive qualities, and it could change. When you say change, do you mean it, it would adapt to uh, a greater load? It would adapt to uh, an extreme temperature? Like, what, what kind of range of changes are you pursuing with, so with it AIMS? Can, it can essentially, an airfoil can change the camber. So if I change the camber, that means the lifting capability changes, the da drag profile changes. So that is an adaptive platform. But it all depends upon what level you are trying to change the material. If I want to incorporate self-sensing, self-healing properties, 
I may be looking at just the material length scale or you know, a specimen and a system before I get to that length scale because I want to see what I have done at the molecular level, whether there is any effect at this system level. So it may not be, in that case, it is not adaptive, but it's telling us what's going on inside the material. And so maybe I can come up with a way of self-healing mechanism. Right. Um, or if I know that there is a D-bond growing in my you know, a dreamliner, before it comes for maintenance, if I can figure that out, so maybe it can do some predictive maintenance. So self-healing materials is, I think, something that would generate a lot of interest for a lot of people, and that would obviously have applications outside of aerospace. Yes. And that's the same for a lot of your work at yes. Ames. It's something yes. you stated up top, saying yes. that you want to create a platform that can transcend just aerospace materials. Can, can you tell me a little bit more about like the wide-ranging applications of your work? So I actually got a funding from the Department of Transportation on remote sensing and the capability to um, give early warnings as to when the bridge needs to be closed. And I basically had very little knowledge of civil infrastructure, but they wanted some technologies because the aerospace technology in these areas have advanced a lot. So they wanted to bring in those you know, technologies that we have developed for aerospace platforms. And it worked really well. So we came up with a way to give you a red flag you know, for bridge closure. They want it to be you know, on a ThinkPad or an iPhone where people in the county can look at and see, okay, I need to close that bridge. Did you ever think you'd be working in civil no, infrastructure? No, no, no. <laughs> That's a big jump. And actually the project was reviewed very well by the program manager. Uh, and he encouraged me to uh, apply for the next three years. And uh, I'm a hardcore materials and aerospace person. I said, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to stay with my planes, uh, planes or automobiles or, or you yeah. know, mechanical systems. Well, and that's another thing. I mean, mm -hmm. a huge part of fuel efficiency would be materials that something is made out of, right? And you could easily make more fuel efficient cars if they oh, were yes. made out of more, um, not only robust but lighter materials. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another place that I'm sure your yes. your your research would have huge impact. Yes, yes, especially um, you know, for example, high temperature materials that. We are working on ceramic matrix materials. Uh, when I started working in that area, it was of interest to Air Force. Right. Uh, Army for propulsion and uh, hypersonic vehicles, right? But recently I came across a BAA from the Department of Energy, mm -hmm. which talked about land-based turbines. And their goal is to go all the way to 3,000 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, such material don't exist. Ceramics. I was, well, yeah, I was okay. Yeah, I was going to say what what and, can withstand that temperature. Yes, so we were very happy to see that you know we got the word, and now we are working on. So a lot of things happen. There is at that high temperature, there is oxidation of the material, and the atmospheric, you know, the moisture absorption that changes the material characteristics. Now, if oxygen seeps in, essentially, if oxidation degrades my material. What does it do at the constituent scale? Mm -hmm. How do I know whether my matrix is cracking or it's a fiber? And if the matrix cracks, the load has to be carried by the fiber. And so that may initiate some damage mechanism that necessarily will not happen at, let's say, 700 degrees centigrade. And these materials are very interesting. They have a length scale effects, they call it. So at moderate temperature, room temperature, mod intermediate temperature, and high temperature. And the mechanism actually changes as we go from different temperature because the way the, the oxidation actually helps impedes crack propagation in the intermediate temperature range. Does it fuse it in some yes, way? Yes, Interesting. It creates some kind of a you know, plastic zone, so it actually retards the crack growth. So the mechanism changes tremendously, so it's very difficult to come up with a coherent model that can actually understand and bridge these different temperature ranges, not just length scale, but these effects due to oxidation, due to moisture absorption, and so on. So that's a challenging problem. Um, you also mentioned modeling. It's, it's mm -hmm. hard to come up with a model for something like this. Mm -hmm. um, Ames is something of a full service location in that sense, right? You guys can fabricate, you can test, and you can model materials, yes. correct? I started my career as a modeling person with a few computers. 
And we developed a lot of theories for advanced composites, and it was very difficult to essentially validate our analysis efforts. So with the funding from Department of Defense, I was able to you know, buy different types of equipment mm -hmm. just for validation, validation sake. And so my, my modeling approach is very different. I don't start with a, some kind of a finite element analysis, you know, and then essentially, you know, carry on with the larger structure. I want to see the material first under confocal microscopy to see what I'm modeling and then start modeling. And then at every length scale, I want to do experiments to see how my model hypothesis are valid or not. So you, you study a material first. Mm -hmm. create a model based on your study and then you scale up your your yes. the different stresses you put on yes. it as you yes. as you understand right. how this material yes. behaves because the you know the constitutive laws mm -hmm. change from length scale to length scale and i want to make sure that i'm actually taking the right material modeling the right material modeling the uncertainty or variability in the material because if i take a small piece of ceramic from one side of a panel, and then I take another piece from a different side of the panel, there is variability. And that variability is essentially is not something you can inspect and see. It is at the micro level. And especially for uh, ceramic matrix composites, depending on how they are manufactured, the pristine material comes with flaws. And so if you try to idealize that flaw saying that there are voids, 10% of it is void, it does not give you the right failure strength. Because uh, no material is ever not going to have... It's not some... like, you know, it's, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to degrade my damage me mechanics based on the fact that I have 10% void. Right. You really have to know the microstructure, where these voids are. Are they between the toes of the, you know, oven composite? Okay. Or is it, you know, uh, intertoe or intratoe? makes a big difference. So the modeling assumptions, you know, have to be validated, right. you know, experimentally to make sure we are capturing the right physics. Because we all make hypotheses when we model. Our effort is always to reduce the number of hypotheses, making it as realistic as possible. And that's the goal. But you have to prove that, you know, your hypothesis is either correct or incorrect. We're not always correct. And so we should definitely be aware of those, the limitations of the models. This might be a strange question, but do you have a favorite material? Like, is there a material that you just really enjoy working with? Composite or you, material. Any particular composite material or just composites Just composite in materials. I uh, came to the U.S. actually wanting to work on composite materials because I was doing a bachelor's thesis. Unlike here, you know, that was part of our undergraduate uh, uh, curriculum. You mm -hmm. have to do a thesis. Um, and I wanted to do s some stuff that my professor said, okay, you're on your own because composite was not something we were taught at the undergraduate level. Right. So the more I tried to create my own project, um, I had to dig up a lot. And that's why when I said, okay, I want to go to Georgia Tech or someplace in the U.S., I wanted to focus on where I can actually have, um, you know, I can grow right. and learn. Where are those experts? And it was a snail mail time. I was actually <laughs> writing letters to professors. And asking, hey, do you work on composites? Yeah, and what do you do, and what will I be doing, and you know that sort of a thing. You know, uh, Some of them were probably very dumb questions, but I wanted to see right. uh, whether they're really interested or they have some projects that uh, they think I can fit in. And you continue to work on composites today with the, with the ceramics, like you were yeah, speaking about yeah. earlier. So composite is a very, uh, you know, um, it essentially means more than two materials, yeah. you know, constituents blended together. So we work on nanocomposites, where essentially we are introducing this multifunctionality by incorporating nanomaterials. They can be carbon nanotubes. They can be mechanophoric stress responsive materials. The carbon nanotubes can be dispersed in the polymer, or they can grow from the fibers radially. Interesting. They're called fuzzy fibers. So... And there is, uh, you know, experimental evidence from MIT that uh, these fuzzy fiber composites actually improves what we call the interlaminar strength. Because when you bond to composites, at that bonding level, bonding layer, mm -hmm. a lot of things happen. 
And so if it can improve that strength, then we have something you know, that is useful. And so I wanted to prove it even from a theoretical standpoint that these materials, you know, how do we know how much to put in? Is it right. 5%, 10%? You know, am I sacrificing some properties when I'm enhancing something else? Is it the strength of composites that interests you, or is it something beautiful about how like they're constructed on a nanoscale? It's, it, it is actually the way the, you can change the architecture. You can tailor the performance, but just at the material scale by changing the fiber directions, uh, whether it is in plane, right. out of plane, whether it is a, a three-dimensional toe kind of structure, fabric structure, or a completely braided composite. And so this is a material where, depending on what you want to achieve, you can make the material respond to that given loading condition. Like incredibly customizable. Incredibly tailored properties we can get. So it doesn't have to be the molecular scale, it's just at the macro scale by changing the orientations, changing the type of weave, you can tailor the properties based on what you're looking for, be it uh, uh, flutter in an airplane, vibration, or in an automobile, you know, um, the impact, uh, high velocity impact of an engine, uh, when a fan blade breaks out, you know, that surrounding is composite. Um, or a ballistic impact for right. army. So how the composite reacts, right? Those are very uh, important things too. And till today, we really don't understand how damage evolves in composites. A lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. So now that I know what your favorite material is, I want to back up. When did you first become interested in aerospace engineering in general? Like, was there something that inspired you to, to want to do this when you were young? Very early on. So I grew up in um, Indian Institute of Technology campus. Mm -hmm. um, it became solidified, my interest in aerospace. I liked airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, when Neil Armstrong, you know, lunar landing. And I remember going to the, an exhibition where they had the lunar rock, 68. And that kind of uh, reinforced my interest, you know. So uh, in, when you grow up in an IIT, my father was a professor, but he was in agriculture engineering. Uh, those are the five top institutions in Asia. So you have all these intellectuals surrounding you. Right. And I thought, okay, somebody said rocket scientist. How cool <laughs> would that be? <laughs> yeah. Did you, have a, did you have a favorite plane growing up? Like, was there a plane that you're particularly enamored with when you're? Oh, like I just like Boeing because my dad and mom flew when, when they came for the U.S. <laughs> so I like the, you know, it's it's just the fact that uh, su such a heavy piece of metal, and you need to understand aerodynamics. You mm -hmm. need to understand these uh, uh, how the structure performs. You need to understand, you know, how the wings vibrate. And so it's an intersection of so many disciplines. Well, it is. Engine should function well, too, so propulsion comes in. Yeah. So it's a truly multidisciplinary problem. And, of course, you're all about an interdisciplinary challenge. Yes. So. And so I was more interested in the structural part of it, the material structures, mm -hmm. uh, whereas my husband does the fluid mechanics, the flow around airfoil. So you've worked with the Air Force and NASA multiple times over the course of your career. Mm -hmm. um, was there a particular project or, I guess, a particular airframe or plane or aircraft in general that you've worked on or contributed to that you find maybe not even beautiful, but you just think is a very cool piece of equipment? So the research that we get funded from are basic research. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so they're always, you know, 6.0 or 6.1, they call it, in the TRL level, the technology readiness level. So the funding comes from that. But... When you're working with DOD or NASA, you always have to make sure that you know where this fundamental work is going to go into. So when I started my career, I was working with the, the high-speed civil transport. I also worked on the uh, V-22s, NASA's version of the V-22, vertical lift. So those are some of the things that we did uh, were very fascinating because that was the latest and you know, greatest things that they were talking about, like reducing the acoustics when it's flying, the, the high-speed civil transport flies over, you know, populated areas, um, not just 
modeling the wing for vibration, but the wing and the body of the uh, the airplane. Mm-hmm. And in a vertical takeoff and landing, when you're talking about V-22, you know, it flies like an airplane and it hovers like a helicopter. Right. So those were very, very different length scale, really system level. When it boils down to it is structural dynamics and understanding the mechanics of how these, you know, things interact. And again, when I did my MURI uh, from Air Force, the component where we had to essentially show how our models work is something that Boeing provided, because I can put all my theories and show that, okay, it works on a flat plate under a certain type of loading in my lab, but does it work in a real component? So they provided me with the shape and you know a, a material, that a uh, piece of structure that goes in the undercarriage of the F-16. Oh, okay. And they had to modify it slightly because of uh, uh, international students working on it. Right. But that was a very beneficial to Boeing because we were applying all our basic research to something that they considered a hot spot. Um, so. And AMIRI, a that's a multi university research initiative? Yes. I know yes. an acronym. Yes. Excellent. So, in your TED talk, you shared this great story about receiving a less than warm welcome your first day of aerospace engineering. Did you encounter kind of any other resistance uh, to your desired career path or was your family um, like more supportive of it than you'd think? My family, without my family, I wouldn't be where I am because they basically said gender is never an issue. Really? It was never even discussed in my family. So my parents always said that hard work, passion, you mm-hmm. can do anything. So they even pushed me to the point of, you know, be the best in whatever you're doing. So that was never an issue. My father always used to say that research, discovery, whatever you want to call it, in every facet of life is colorblind to gender. So that's what I believe in. Mm -hmm. And my parents encouraged me all along. So I never really faced anything until the day I walked in to my department and I I was greeted with that aerospace is not for women. It was a tacit disapproval. That kind of uh, level of support you receive from your family, do you think you've kind of taken those values incorporated into how you run your own lab? Yes, definitely. My father was a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. And so I knew when a story is coming, there has to be a moral at the end of it. (laughs) But some of them resonate still. Like he used to say, every time I brought in a report card that said, oh, you got 100 in this and 100 in that, he would tell me the story of Isaac Newton, remind me, you know, how little we know Mm -hmm. and how deep is that unknown part of the ocean. And it still resonates. I tell my students, whenever they say, you know, okay, we have solved this problem, no. Just think and critique and see what we have missed. A very important lesson that uh, also resonates is uh, humility, because my I believe strongly that the moment ego can really impede our journey. So you have to admit when you're wrong. And you also have to acknowledge the people around you who made it possible for you to be where you are. So I try to essentially, you know, treat my research program and train my students with that kind of philosophy, that knowledge is a lifelong thing. And There is no harm in admitting you're wrong. What are some ways you try and uh, help your students excel and succeed? I interviewed a few of your students to prepare for the podcast, and they both said that I think in our lab, students end up publishing a little bit more than they might elsewhere. Is that an opportunity you really try to push your students for? Yes, because what I tell them is, you know, I don't want my CV to grow anymore, but their career has they need those publications. Right. And they need quality publications. Mm -hmm. Most important, when you do something exciting, you need to publish. Uh, When students come to interview me, I always, or interview with me, I always tell them, my expectations are everything is due yesterday. I try to kind of see whether they're really passionate about it because of the, you know, unless you're passionate, you can get burned out very easily. So that's what I, and, but the thing is, I don't know the answer to everything. So I've told them always, we agree to disagree. 
And that's something I always tell my new students that we have to agree to disagree because if I knew the answer, then why will DOD give me a three-year or four-year funding? So they get the freedom. You know, I kind of give them some guidance. They get the freedom to explore. And that's where the passion comes in. Where do you think you'd be today if you hadn't pursued engineering? It was a toss-up in ninth grade. In India, believe me, in high school is uh-huh. when you decide your fate. Really? I can't imagine doing that. Actually, in the eighth grade final exam. So if your scores in physics and math are not high enough, you don't even enter the science, they call it. It's closed off to you. Yes. So uh, I was uh, also interested in writing, and language was one of my very uh, favorite topics. So there were teachers coming to my house, almost volunteering and saying, okay, heaven doesn't lie in engineering, you know, what... She should be doing this. Aggressively recruited by the arts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was a toss-up, and probably, you know, I still li- I like poetry a lot. I love mm-hmm. to read and uh, something in that area, probably. Interesting. I don't think that's something you usually hear from engineers. That's why I don't believe in left brain, right brain. I, I, I know <laughs> you don't. I know. Um, and again, you're, you're a very multidisciplinary person, but a lot of engineers I've I've talked to, they say, well, if it wasn't engineering, I probably would have ended up in in mathematics or physics or something like that. Now, my parents actually um, encouraged us to diversify. So Mm -hmm. we had a lot of extracurricular activities, you know, um, extempore speeches, debates on different random topics, um, take part in in inter-school or inter-district essay competition, basically, you know, reinforcing writing skills. Right. But I love to write, so that's when the interest in language came. But I owe it to my parents to make me, you know, the only thing they couldn't do is make me an athlete. My, my <laughs> mom was an athlete and an educator, but... Well, your mom was a professor as well? No, she actually, she got her college degree when she was 18. Mm-hmm. And she has multiple, you know, degrees in stats and uh, econ. So when they both started their career... My mom was making double my dad's salary. My dad was a professor. And for a couple of years of, uh, you know, uh, when I was about two or so, my mom quit. She wanted to just put all her energy in me. And uh, so that was a decision she made. But she was also an athlete. She used to do crazy things like rope walking and... uh, (laughs) Like uh, like a gymnast? Yes. Wow. And she was a great uh, badminton and tennis player. my brother and I would be on one side of the court, and she would make us run back and forth, and you know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's interesting. We've spoken a lot about your research and your work and, and your lab, but like, what are some things aside from poetry and reading you do in your spare time, or even if that's one of the only things you do? Like, what are some of your uh, I favorites? I like tending to my roses. I grew up, you know, my dad was passionate about your garden. His garden. Oh, okay. And. Uh, I still remember in high school, he got a new rose bush, and its name was Madame Curie. <laughs> and it was a yellow rose, and yellow roses are very hard to grow. Are they? Yes, I didn't know that. Yes, okay. they are very sensitive. And he told me, you're in charge. If you want to be like Madame Curie, take care of the rose bush. But I loved uh, working with my dad, and uh, so I tried to grow rose here in Arizona, which is challenging. I was going to say that must be difficult. Yeah. So you garden, you read, you love poetry. Just the roses. But believe me, I don't get time to do all of these things. Do you ever have your students over to garden for you? I think you're giving me ideas now. <laughs> <laughs> in their quote-unquote free time. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you know, extra credit. So I know your husband is also an engineer, and you you said he worked in fluid dynamics, correct? Mm -hmm. So how is balancing both of your careers and and life at home when you both have very demanding jobs? Yes. So when we have, we both have our PhDs from Georgia Tech, and we started our career at NASA Langley. And the reason we went to NASA Langley, of course, it's a dream job, but we also got, it's a dual career problem. Right. But my husband knew I was passionate about this academic freedom and research. And so he actually sacrificed his NASA career, and he was very happy with what he was doing. Uh, He was working on uh, hypersonics, you know, and so on. And he moved here with me and joined the Poly Campus. 
Um, so that was a huge sac sacrifice he made. And his unwavering support and made it easy for me to balance both. So it's a Sun Devil family. My son is also a mechanical engineer here. He started with an aerospace, decided to change so that he doesn't hear his mom and dad always tell him, <laughs> oh, this is an easy course, but uh, he's graduating with the mechanical this semester. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Congratulations to him and you. So without him, my husband's support, probably would have been very, very difficult because anytime I talk to women faculty, you know, there's always a complaint that uh, we have to do more than right. our spouses. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're asking me, my husband probably does 55%. <laughs> when I was um, interviewing your students to prepare for this podcast, Sadat was telling me that he really wanted to join your lab after he took a composites class by you. And he said he, uh, he started working for free and until, in his words, you relented and gave him a position. Um, <laughs> is, is that a somewhat common thing that happens? No, it, it's not, because it's not. I, I do a lot of soul searching before I make an offer to a student. So they go through some rigorous in-house personnel committee interviews, through, which are my students at right. postdocs. And um, I give them both sides, you know, that this is how bad your life may be if you really don't enjoy. So they need to so go talk to other professors and then come back if you still want to work with me. Uh, but then we also get these um, students who come unfunded. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're always stopping by with resumes, you know, wanting to get support from different faculty members, which is very common. Uh, Siddhant was in my composites class, and he was trying to bring a CV. My admin intercepted him, but he was very bold. He just left the CV <laughs> and ran. And then he, you know, talked to my postdoc and said, can I volunteer? And my postdoc actually paid attention to his CV and he saw that he did something that was more than an undergraduate in India um, uh, could do. So he said, can you, can we hire him as an hourly? So we don't usually do that. So we hired him as an hourly and he did so good that, uh, yeah, he's, he's now an Army Research Lab postdoc. Um, oh, he's, has he left the lab? No, because oh, okay. ACU, my center is part of ARL Extended. You know, we are part of the UCLA, Stanford, um, you know, they're divided into zones. So the goal of these extended campus is to be able to hire non-citizens mm -hmm. to work on Army-related uh, material. So the fact, uh, you know, I've been funded by Army for a long time, but, uh, you know, they really, when they come here, they get to meet the students. And not everybody is domestic. In mm -hmm. fact, the majority is international. And they were very, uh, so they were, you know, I've been blessed with good students pretty much all my life, knock on wood. So uh, they were impressed. And they said they wanted to start the ARL Extended here. And the first postdoc to be hired is Siddhant. So he's located in my lab, but he works on an army-related project. Interesting. He was telling me about it. Was it the electrically activated shape, shape memory polymer? Yes, yeah. morphing. Yes. Which he told me about that, and I, re I initially said oh, Batman, like Batman. Yes. And he was like, Yeah, yeah, but yeah, kind of yes, like that, but shape, metal. <laughs> shape, shape memory materials. You know, basically, the reason it's called shape memory, you know, it retains its shape after the excitation or whatever you want to, whether exactly. it's electrical or thermal. Mm -hmm. It comes back to your original has, shape. Again, uh, an insane amount of applications. Yeah. All yeah, kinds of yeah. things. Adaptive, morphing, and so on. So one thing that you you brought up during your KED talk, and mm -hmm. um, I've also heard you talk about a couple different times, is how there's, there's no demarcation in research, that everything kind of bleeds together at least a little bit. Can you tell me a little about how you kind of came to that philosophy and how you practice that in your work? So traditionally, we researchers tend to focus on our little disciplines where we have been trained and mm -hmm. have the expertise. And anything that is outside my expertise is either not important enough or, you know, less important. And I don't believe in that. And especially being an aerospace engineer, although I work with the structures and materials, these structures and materials, the airplane wing and the fuselage, 
the way they deform depend upon how the fluid flows. So that is why I don't believe, you know, that you can only keep doing what you're doing because everything lies at the intersection of these transdisciplinary boundaries. You have to be able to, even if I'm not an expert in that area, mm -hmm. I need to be able to understand or bring in an expertise so that, you know, whatever I'm developing becomes more realistic. You've also said that sometimes people are territorial about their disciplines as well. Yes, yes. Um, and it's sometimes hard to get people to collaborate because yes. someone over here does not want mm -hmm. the, the nosy aerospace engineer pushing into their field. H how is that something you've dealt with over the course of your career? I'll give you an example of the MUTI I got. So I was being funded by FOSR on smart composite structures at that point, and I called up the program manager when I saw the MURI announcement, and the MURI announcement was on metals. But the theme was understanding defects in metals and developing techniques to quantify, classify these defects, and establish what is the residual use for life of these materials. So when I called him up, he told me, you realize you're not a metals person. I told him I'm going to study metals before I write my proposal. I learned a lot. Uh -huh. uh, so it is. it was outside my comfort range, but I got interested in metals also. So, you know, later on I worked on super alloys like titanium and so on. Um, so definitely, you know, there are things that are outside our comfort zone. But in knowledge to safety, every material has some kind of a flaw inside or something happens inside it and that crack grows. So the underlying theme is you really cannot ensure safety unless you know what's going on at the material length scale. So that's very uh, multidisciplinary in nature and it keeps us busy <laughs> <laughs> because we are always reading papers and learning new things. And the territorial part is you cannot really blame this because we are all going for funding, right. and that's our survival. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, it's just part of this, you know, our, our uh, system is. Thank you for your time today, Professor. I really enjoyed talking to you. I hope everyone at home learned something uh, and enjoyed listening. Thank you, Pete, for listening to me. It has not been a solo journey. I've had a lot of people, uh, a lot of mentors, and I still learn from my students. Thank you. If you're interested in more from Aditi Chattopadhyay, watch the ASU KED Talks video at research.asu.edu slash KED Talks. Subscribe to our podcast through your favorite podcast directory and find us on Facebook and Twitter at ASU Research.